Thank you, Siri. <laughs> All righty. So um, this is meant to be a conversation and, and more of a free-flowing um interview, but there are some questions that are scripted that I will circle back to over time. Um, so the beginning is rather regimented, and then we sort of find our way through it. Um, so thank you again for agreeing to join me this morning to do this one-on-one. -on -one. As you know, the aim of this interview is really to explore your lived experiences within the domains of equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, your participation in this interview is voluntary, and if at any point you want to uh, step out, take a break, end early, or pause, just let me know. You're welcome to do so. Um, these interviews are recorded in order for transcripts to be generated. The recordings themselves don't get submitted anywhere, um, and they are anonymized after the fact, so even if names are shared, those will get eliminated out of the way. So with that being said, do I have your consent to start? Yes. Beautiful. And bef um, before we actually get started, do you have any questions for me? No, I don't think so. Beautiful. So for the record, can you please state your age, your gender, and your role at the Cancer Center? So I'm a radiation oncologist, um, I'm female, and I'm 44. Beautiful. Um, so the very first question is me asking you to define or explain three terms in sequence. Um, so the first one is how would you define or explain the term equity to someone? I guess I would describe the term equity um, to reflect without using the word equity, um, to, to sort of reflect um, opportunities that are the same um, through, um, if we're in the medical context, um, through the medical journey, um, as a patient, um, as a professional, um, I think it should be reflective of the same um, opportunities as as a staff to participate um, and to provide patient care across a wide range of spectrums. All right. So really about people being allowed to reach the same end point or, or at least be able to get to the same starting line, if you will. Hmm. Yeah. Right. Um, and how would you define or explain diversity to someone? I, guess I would explain diversity as a composition of features mm -hmm. that reflect either phenotypically um, or psychologically our differences. Mm -hmm. um, and that innately, um, whether diversity is reflective of race, mm -hmm. of culture, of um, ethnic background, um, it, it really means a compilation of all of those things um, to me, including, I think, gender identity. Mm -hmm. um, diversity really is a compilation of what makes us who we are mm -hmm. um, and does reflect, I guess, our differences um, from one person to another. Absolutely. Um, and then lastly, how would you define or explain inclusivity or inclusion? I think when I hear the word inclusivity, um, what it reflects to me again is just un a, a universal acceptance um, that despite diversity, that despite our, our challenges or our differences, um, that we are all entitled to inclusion. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so keeping those ideas, those themes in mind, um, sort of do you see these domains influencing the patient-clinician interaction, and if so, in what ways? I think they influence the patient-clinician interaction in the sense that as you build relationships, um, clinical relationships, of trust with your patients is that there is opportunity for your patients to share mm -hmm. um, how they identify themselves, what things about them 
maybe different or make them diverse. Um, and I think there is both the explicit spoken aspect mm-hmm. of of those conversations, and then there's also an implicit aspect to being a medical professional um, in a relationship with a patient um, that you recognize and respect um, the patient's perspective. So can you, so we'll explore both of those aspects. I'll I'll start by asking about the implicit side because I think that's less well defined or, or, you know, it's, it's not something that you can objectively pick up necessarily all the time. So what sorts of implicit things you see coming up um, in interactions? I think in, like you you mean in the clinician patient um, interactions, I mean, I think that if we take a step back um, from our conversation about the three terms, I mean, I think that we definitely um, rely on the context of conversation. We also rely on the context of body language, of eye contact, of um, a person's dress, of a person's uh, cultural identity that you can determine sometimes just based on their phenotypic appearance. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think implicitly, we immediately, without spoken word, um, are able or should be able to recognize the context um, that the patient brings to um, their their diagnosis and their conversation just based on Um, the visual um, interactions that we have and the, I think just body language um, and appearance Mm -hmm. are helpful in terms of identifying um, routes and avenues to potentially explore with the patient how their, um, how their perspectives on equity, how their perspectives on diversity may be impactful in terms of their treatment journeys. Can you give an example to just explore that a little bit more? An instance where, you know, you walked into a patient room and seeing this patient in front of you based on the body language, based on how they presented, based on um, sort of nonverbal cues that were offered to you that it guided the conversation in a way that maybe you hadn't fully mapped out coming into that room earlier? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that I have definitely been in situations with patients and family members Mm -hmm. where the dynamic and conversation around diagnosis and treatment are very much to a large degree guided not as much by the patient themselves, but by the family members in the room. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that um, reflects if it's sort of the husband or the son who do a lot of the talking Mm -hmm. um, that though, like I've been in those situations where um, in terms of wanting to be, respectful um, to everyone's perspective, um, but yet at the same time addressing the patient herself. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think I, in certain circumstances, similar to what I'm describing, you you recognize immediately um, that there may be a a dominance in terms of of information being provided. Um, And I do find it very difficult sometimes to address the patient mm-hmm. when the majority of the conversation um, is being um, fielded right. by by other family members. And I think it does make me feel a little bit uncomfortable as to I'm very conscious um, in situations like that to not be um, coming off as aggressive mm-hmm. or um devaluing the opinion of other family members in the room 
Um, but I think that's probably one of the things that, that I do struggle with the most, mm-hmm. um, is just having equitable contributions sometimes, yeah. um, from the patient themselves versus, um, the ancillary family members. And it, it is difficult sometimes to a certain whether, um, you know, the lack of verbal contribution, um, from the patient is reflective of normalcy in terms of their, um, their cultural beliefs. Mm-hmm. How do you, how do you navigate that? How do you, you know, it, maybe acknowledge, maybe don't acknowledge, but also feel the waters of what, you know, is in your lived experience, an uncomfortable dynamic. Yeah. I mean, I think what I've learned over the past decade is that um, we have an opportunity as care providers um, and, in fact, a responsibility um, to I, – I do try when I sense the unspoken um, uncomfortableness, um, I do try to address it in a way that is open and transparent and respectful. All at the same, all at the same time. Mm -hmm. Um, I very much, um, if I pick up on some of those challenging dynamics when the patient and family are in front of me, Mm -hmm. um, I very much will address Mm -hmm. um, it with, with the patient um, and her family. And a lot of that comes from both what I'm speaking verbally, but also the way that I nonverbally engage and make eye contact and communicate with the patient themselves. Right. And how is that, how has that been received? I mean, obviously there will be exceptions to any given strategy, but how often, like more often than not, how does the family engage with that when you are opening that dialogue and really trying to try to shift and empower um, your patient, um, but also keep the therapeutic relationship with her loved ones yeah i mean i think that i've not had negative counter transference like i've not had um thankfully um the generation of of sort of conflict distrust or compromise of the therapeutic relationship i think sometimes you know in in terms of approach being inquisitive and humble um, and recognizing that there are aspects of people's lives that we don't always understand. Um, and I am not uncomfortable opening the door to have those conversations or um, being inquisitive enough um, with the family and the patient to help educate myself um, and ask questions that I think may be helpful moving forward for me to provide better care Mm -hmm. and more sensitive, culturally sensitive care um, in a way that's sort of respectful to the, to the family. So I've not ever been really met with resistance. Mm -hmm. Um, I think approaching aspects of people's lives that you may not necessarily understand with honesty mm-hmm. and questions that are really from a place of truth and trust to help you understand um, have have always been met with reception like good reception from yeah. from my patients i would I would say yeah, so you know what I'm hearing is when you come into it sort of with transparency and but also kindness I think is a big thing and and you do frame it from the standpoint that this is being <clears throat> done with a genuineness to move and navigate care forward I one should imagine that it's always going to be better received than a more paternalistic um I think bulldozer approach to that conversation yeah and I mean I guess probably if I think about my you know stereotypes and biases um I think perhaps that that degree of sensitivity and that degree of approaching conversations that many people would find uncomfortable and delicate, um, it, it is probably different. And I acknowledge that um, f- 
for me being a female care provider as opposed to as opposed to a, a male care provider. And I think it's fair to disclose that, you know, perhaps situations that I've shared with colleagues or that colleagues have shared with me, um, particularly working in in a male dominated profession, um, I I think my I have altered my approach to sort of sensitivity and transparency. And you're right, just sort of coming from a place of kindness, empathy, mm-hmm. and um, intuition that there are many things that you don't understand about people. Yeah. I mean, in that vein, you know, recognizing that you have adapted, but probably also inherently had a certain approach to patient care that is individual to you yourself. Um, are, have there been interactions that you've borne witness to either by a colleague, a previous preceptor, or even a learner where either this was done incredibly well, where they integrated these domains and that really stands out in your mind, or conversely, perhaps, where it was done really not well and, and it really stands out in your mind because it, it left you with that sense of like, oof, afterwards. Mm-hmm. I think I've been blessed in the sense that no, like I've not really had a distasteful or difficult experience that's like left me to sort of navigate how not to do that. Um, I've had a lot of positive experiences and I think it's just because of the the diversity of my, of my practice. And I, I think that I've actually learned an incredible amount um, working in particular with the um, young, like the AYA patient population. Mm-hmm. Um, and it has helped me. So because I work in, in pediatrics and uh, cancer survivorship a couple times a week, mm-hmm. I've actually learned an incredible amount. I would say in the past five years in particular, um, as people have become more open mm-hmm. to talking about things like gender identity, mm-hmm. um, inclusivity, <laughs> mm-hmm. I have many, many patients um, in that particular population who have gone through gender transitions, mm-hmm. um, who have navigated, you know, pediatric cancer diagnoses that have been life altering and life changing, mm-hmm. but also generationally are um you know, navigating life in a different era than I did. Mm -hmm. And I think being, for me, being in touch and in tune with the challenges Mm -hmm. that that particular patient group uh, deals with has been very helpful and very insightful. Um, My pediatric colleagues in particular, I think, are much better equipped and better trained (laughs) um, to help uh, engage in conversations where even the language that we use to relate and communicate um, to our patients is um, appropriate and sensitive. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that aspect of my life and my practice has changed how I look at um, certain challenges that many that many young people are dealing with and facing, I would say. I can only have been positive experiences. Yeah. And so what is that like in reflection? Because you said, especially in the last five years that this has really come to the front. Um, what what is that like for a patient to try to engage in what is an incredibly personal but also delicate um, conversation with a healthcare provider, knowing that historically our transgender populations have not always received the best care from the Canadian mm. healthcare system. Um, so, what are some nuances to um, those conversations that that stand out in your mind? Well, I mean, I think that in terms of my experiences through the survivorship clinics, I think the context of those clinics is quite important because these are patients that I have cared for and known. And in some cases, actually now that I'm I'm more than a decade into practice, that I've treated Mm -hmm. as children, Mm -hmm. I actually have one patient um, who was treated as a child Mm -hmm. um, under my care um, who had 
many life challenges, many challenges in terms of familial upbringing and lack of support, um, who, when I treated him, Mm -hmm. was a male. Mm -hmm. And through the course of the past five years, he's undergone gender transition Mm -hmm. and has gone through definitive surgery Mm -hmm. and now comes to clinic um, as a different person Mm -hmm. and a different gender Mm -hmm. than I originally met and cared for. Mm -hmm. Um, So, so I have the benefit of sort of seeing when we talk about like gender transition and gender identity, I, because of the longitudinal aspect of care that I provide at McMaster, I've had the opportunity to kind of see what that journey is like Mm -hmm. and to continue to provide care both during Mm -hmm. um, in the case of gender transition um, and after. Mm -hmm. Um, And there is definitely for me, I think a level of discomfort sometimes um, and a level of anxiety um, in terms of wanting to make sure Mm -hmm. that I am appropriately addressing that I am appropriately open Mm -hmm. um, and that I'm still able to provide the level of care Mm -hmm. and have conversation because a lot of that follow-up is psychologic um, follow-up in the clinics that I'm able to do that to the same level Mm -hmm. without like without I guess allowing my unspoken judgment right. to to come through and, and that's really what I've learned to do better I think from my pediatric from my colleagues and so I know that you mentioned earlier that it feels like your pediatric colleagues perhaps have um, more training um, to face some of these more nuanced challenges as they arise. When you reflect on your training, um, both as a staff and as a trainee going through radiation oncology training, um, can you recollect if you ever received any formal training within equity, diversity, or inclusivity? No. Um mm-hmm. Were there ever any, like, informal opportunities for you to shore up those those skill sets? I mean, I think there probably may have been if on an individual basis through training at McMaster, if I had, you know, that was a long time ago. But now I know that um, from an educational standpoint, from a post-grad standpoint, Mm -hmm. that these conversations are front and center and that they are part of the academic curriculum for the majority or if not all residency programs. Um, so I think those, there has been a transition right. from the time that I was training. Okay. Um, but to answer your question, I don't really know. I never sought out those um, opportunities if they were there um, because I feel like at the time when I was a resident um, that we had less conversation mm-hmm. about all of these, um, you know, day to day challenges that we face that um, we never had those conversations. Yeah. And so, you know, when you think back to your practice now for the last number of years, especially appreciating that like EDI is, is a very like hip term and it's becoming very much part of like the academic zeitgeist. Um, Has there been professional outreach, say within the division or department where they've been like, you know, you are faculty seek out these opportunities or like, let's have seminars or anything like that. No, no. And so when you, when we reflect on that, I think there is an appreciation now that these are conversations that need to be had. Um, you know, curricula are at least acknowledging the importance of integration. But when you look at training and you think back on, you know, your training as a RADONC trainee and and the current one as, as faculty to learners, where would you see that integrated? Honestly, I think in 2022, I would see it integrated um, both concretely, 
within the competence by design curriculum. Mm -hmm. Um, I think in many ways it could very much be entrenched Mm -hmm. into the pillars of can Mm -hmm. for sure. Um, And I think it does go beyond just having one academic half half day session a year Mm -hmm. um, to talk about, um, you know, equity, diversity and inclusion. I think it needs to be integrated on a daily basis when you walk into clinic, um, because none of us know when we walk into the room um, what that interaction is going to entail. And I think in terms of, I, I, I mean, I guess I think in terms of competence by design, at least we've acknowledged that there is a need for in the moment evaluative conversations. And I think if we take that a step further, if we do encounter families, patients aware challenges in terms of the therapeutic relationship um, may result um, as, as a result of sort of differences in, in opinion or differences in cultural backgrounds, um, I think we, uh, we have to embrace in the moment those opportunities to have the open conversation when they're encountered. Mm-hmm. Um, but this is not purely um, a tick off the box. Yes, we did an academic half day for, you know, addressing equity, diversity and inclusiveness. And so I guess, and I mean, there is no clear answer and I'm certainly curious to hear your thoughts on it. Um, but how do you take something that is this nebulous and a lot of it very experiential mm-hmm. and homogenize it to be something that can be integrated into a curricula that can be sort of disseminated to the masses at large, um, in a way that is that, you know, the trainee and the preceptor um, have objective things to evaluate without tokenizing it. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that's one of the problems with um, the transition to competence by design. It is very much tokenized, right? Um, in the sense that the resident comes to clinic with a set of, um, in the old days we'd call it objectives, but now they come with a set of, um, EPAs. of uh, milestones and EPAs that they're in their head hoping to address during that during that clinic mm-hmm. um i think that this issue or um conversation needs to be separate from the from the epas but i think in terms of um i think in terms of the conversation i think it is timely not just that the residents um are trained in terms of sensitivity and an approach to dealing with equity, diversity, and inclusiveness, but also that the staff are. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think to a large part, we focus because we're an academic institution on ensuring that we are meeting training requirements, particularly training requirements around professionalism for our residents, mm-hmm. which is great. Mm-hmm. Um, and timely in terms of the, the, the stage that they're training at and having an awareness of the world around us and what types of things need to be addressed. But I think we've dropped the ball in terms of, in terms of providing support and training and conversation or opportunity for conversation when it comes to staff. And so how do you, I mean, so there is an inherent bias, right, that people who want to be engaged in those conversations will be engaged in those conversations. I guess, how do you empower the the middle ground, people who will say, well, eh, whatever, it's not really my responsibility, this is just another thing to do, versus those, albeit very, very much the minority, who dig their heels in and be like, this is PC gone too far. Like, how do you empower that cohort um, to care? Well, I mean, I think as clinicians, the rational argument would be that in order to provide continuing, ongoing, appropriate care that is standard of care um, and to build 
um, what I would consider to be um, relationships of trust um, and confidence with your patients. These are conversations that need to be had. Mm -hmm. And within your division and department, would you say that there is a culture um, around having these conversations either personally or professionally? Um, you know, is this like, a, is there a culture to be talking about these things? I mean, I think probably amongst our department in terms of distribution, um, basically, I mean, we have a large cohort of um, practicing staff that are likely in their final decade of clinical practice. And I think independent of what we're talking about, whether it's diversity, equity, inclusion, or anything additional, um, given our current environment, there is a sense of complacency. Mm -hmm. They're just not engaged because they're at a different stage Mm -hmm. um, in in their professional lives. I think for many of us who are in the earlier stages of our profession and recognize that the world is changing, that we are changing, that our stereotypes and biases are changing every day, Mm -hmm. um, that having appropriate um, means and tools um, as a care provider to have these conversations is important. Mm-hmm. Um, but I guess, you know, in terms of generating buy-in, you're right. You said it earlier. It's just another, it, a lot of people will view, you know, the recommendation. Not, this is never going to be something that's mandatory. Mm-hmm. Um, or at least in my view, it won't be from a staff perspective. Um, you know, you don't, generating universal buy-in is very difficult. Yeah, because it, there's a million and one things to do in a day. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you can only pick so many at any given point in time. Yeah. I I think asking for you to reflect a bit more introspectively, you know, you, you speak very eloquently about a lot of these things. Clearly, it's something that you integrate into your practice in reflection, knowing that it wasn't something that was taught to you professionally um, as a staff or as a learner, when did you first, you know, recognize something to do with these domains? Maybe not in the terms that they're laid out in now, but when did you first start to have a recognition of of these aspects um, as, as it related to you personally or within your academic career? I think probably um, on a personal level, I have an innate sensitivity to diversity in particular, um, coming from a place of being married to my husband, Mm -hmm. who is from a completely different ethnic and cultural background than myself Mm -hmm. and having now children Mm -hmm. who are biracial. Mm -hmm. um, I think very much that my personal um, and family life have been more impactful than anything Mm -hmm. in terms of, um, in terms of how I practice professionally Mm -hmm. and how I guess if you want to use the word insightful or in tune, I am to being sensitive and recognizing that people come through the door mm-hmm. to see us with a whole background that we may not necessarily completely understand. Mm-hmm. Um, and that does come from both my personal life. And I think also, um, for me as an individual growing up and training and being from such a small part of Canada mm-hmm. where there was a lot of homogeneity, there wasn't a lot of heterogeneity mm-hmm. um, and coming to a large center um, was an incredible adjustment. Mm-hmm. It was an incredible adjustment. Um, my husband always makes the joke that when I came to Ontario, 
um, I did see everyone as the same, despite the fact that everyone's not the same. Right. Um, and he would often, um, growing up in a larger center where there's so much ethnic diversity, um, I remember having conversations like 25 years ago in terms of like, you know, how how he would identify somebody was often by their race. Mm-hmm. And I I never grew up hearing that. Right. So to me, it was very, I just thought that there were other ways besides their race mm-hmm. to identify the person. Right. Um, and he always said to me, he's like, you're, you're so like, you're very race blind. Like, of course that person's Asian, yeah. you know, but I would never like describe the person that way. Right. I would think about using like other traits mm-hmm. other than their race to define them. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was like, that was like eye opening for me. And I think I'm still programmed to think that way mm-hmm. um, because of how I was raised and where I came from. And what was that transition like? Like, was it a gut punch to, you know, transition from a community? Like you said, that there was a lot of cultural and identified homogeneity within that population to shift to a center where I guess people's differences were more stark, but also, you know, blatantly things that people carry with them. Mm -hmm. Um, And what was that as a transition for you as a person? Was it uncomfortable? Was it something that you embraced readily? Um, Did it ever force you to have reflections within yourself that you um, didn't really anticipate that you were going to have to have? Um, I think honestly, I, everyone's different, but I think for me, it was something that I embraced with sort of inquisition and excitement Mm -hmm. to actually learn more Mm -hmm. about the people around me. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was just, from my perspective, it was just very, it wasn't a burden. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, um, uh, you know, oh, now I have to kind of understand this. Yeah. Um, it was more just to be respectful and inquisitive and, and to embrace the opportunity to learn. Yeah, for sure. Um, so when you reflect on that and you reflect on, you know, all of the experiences you've gone through, um, how comfortable would you say you feel when it comes to these domains? Um, and are there any learning curves or learning edges that you set for yourself as you look to the next 10 years of your practice? I mean, I think that in terms of learning curves are things that I like hope to continue to work on or continue to improve on. Um, I've never really thought about that, I guess, in terms of, you know, do I have, do I have an objective list of what I'd like to accomplish over the next 10 years when it comes to, to some of these, uh, to some of these differences? Um, I guess just the, just the continued want to be open, engaging, and to continue to learn from people. Mm-hmm. For sure. And to continue to want, and to continue to allow myself the time Mm-hmm. within the clinical relationship to prioritize that. Mm-hmm. I guess exploring that theme, because I've heard it before where people will say, well, there's just time is the biggest constraint. There's never enough time to be able to engage in a lot of these things. How do you reconcile that? Knowing that you have finite space to see a very full clinic, how do you carve out those moments? And, or do you um, to to have these, I guess, more personalized um, touch points with your patients? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I just do because it's important. Like, I think because it's important to me. Mm -hmm. um, And it actually, it doesn't take astronomically more time. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like when people say that, it's probably just a, perhaps in some ways, a little bit of an excuse not to dive in. Mm -hmm. Um, And I tend to try to take the approach of layering. Mm -hmm. So it's not like you're going to address 
every aspect or every question. Um, but each time I see the person or the family or the person and the family, I think it's more about building layers of conversation and trust. Mm-hmm. And that that really doesn't take that much time. And I think that it has been so positively impactful for me and meaningful for the family that it actually helps to improve all other aspects of the clinical relationship. Um, And then now turning a bit more inward to your lived experience, can you reflect on a time perhaps where someone else didn't recognize your um, diverse identities or did not make equitable or inclusive space for you that impacted you either personally or professionally, um, especially in like, say, the last 10, 15 years as it related to radiation oncology, where like someone either ascribed something to you that wasn't quite right or they didn't quite make space for you because of who you are. I don't have a perfect example of that. I would probably say that we joke about this a little bit, sometimes in a lighthearted way, but each week when the new patients come through and we are setting up our multidisciplinary case conferences and which person is going to be attached to which family, mm-hmm. I think, you know, we've got myself and another and another female that works in our group and then the rest are male. Mm-hmm. Um and we do have conversations sometimes about just equity and patient distribution yes. because I tend um, as the female care provider um, to get assigned in, an, I guess, in a, I don't know what the right word is, but it's, pre- not, an, an, it's not an intentional bias, but yeah. it's a bias whereby even for the nurse, that's like helping to assign the patients to staff. I tend to get assigned to the younger patient cohort, to mm-hmm. the female patients, mm-hmm. to younger patients with families, or those who are coming to us with sort of significant psychologic challenges and burdens. Mm-hmm. And so it, this is not the first time I've heard this, and, and often I find that female clinicians in oncology will state, I will get presented a patient because they're like, well, you know, so-and-so, they they could really benefit from your touch. They could really benefit from, you know, your special expertise or, or, you know, they need a little bit more TLC um, and you're going to do that really well. And so where does that, like, how does that make you feel? And where does that, like, but because it is a bias, right? That somehow a female yeah. clinician is going to provide that extra tender love and care better. Like, where does that derive from? And yeah. why is it continue to be perpetuated? Yeah. I think because there's a recognition in the therapeutic relationship and the differences in how we all practice, um, is that I, as a practicing radiation oncologist, am probably going to be the person um, to spend more of that time conversationally and supportively with the patient mm-hmm. that I'm probably going to be the person as opposed to some other colleagues that um, will explore aspects of life that are existential to their diagnosis and illness. Mm-hmm. Because I know that having those conversations is going to be impactful in terms of their cancer journey. Mm-hmm. Um, some, some people describe it as like roads that they don't want to go down. Right. Um, but, but for me, those are questions that I will ask from the beginning Mm -hmm. rather than like six weeks or eight weeks later. Yeah. But then how do you, I, I mean, this is a complicated question, of course, but you know, how do you decouple that instinctive thing of like oh this person needs more time and care therefore they should go to you know you or they should go to a female um clinician but knowing that you are shouldering the emotional and psychological burden of all of those increased care needs but also pragmatically there's more patient calls there's more interventions there's potentially more hospitalizations so you know like how do you deconstruct the fact that there's very real 
consequences Mm -hmm. by asking the same people to time and time again take on the higher needs cases. I don't think we have a mechanism to. Because, again, these are conversations that we don't have. Mm -hmm. We talk about it now, and I've talked about it myself amongst other female colleagues Mm -hmm. but do we have a like do we have a pathway to address those inequities Mm -hmm. no and is that something that your male colleagues are open to or willing to hear um I think they're very aware Mm -hmm. I think they're very aware of that um in in I think lighthearted non-judgmental ways they will make comments like you know this family is really gonna this this family should be with with you Mm -hmm. and sometimes that does make me angry because you're right it leads to more emotional burden Mm -hmm. for me as the care provider yeah and over time that builds up absolutely You know, one, sure, two, great. But when it is a pattern of your patient population being built every week or every other week for the entirety of your career, it's a lot. Yeah. Um, And so it's just like it's it's a reoccurring theme, and I I don't have a good solution for it. No, because we don't – these are sort of, I guess, unspoken pathways, right? Like these are things that happen. In our day-to-day practice, they will happen for you, too, Mm -hmm. Um, especially, I think, in oncology. I'm sure it's similar in other specialties, but uh, I think there is definite bias in um, in terms of the patients and the patient groups that we see as female providers versus male care providers within the same disease sites. Yeah. Um, And then the last question that I have for you is, is there anything that we've not discussed over the course of this conversation that you would want to share or have said or discussed as it relates to the research question, which is understanding how oncologists learn or understand the domains of EDI? I don't think so. I mean, I guess the hope would be that through this work that you're doing, um, that it will help to objectify the need um, to have formal learning pathways and conversations about these important issues. Mm-hmm. I think because we don't currently have that. Mm-hmm. I think a lot, you know, this is a huge conversation, and I think that there were aspects of things that we discussed today um, that related to multiple aspects of diversity, I think the one area of medicine, particularly that's become more vocal in the past decade, is the is the disparity, like the des- like the differences mm-hmm. um, between female and male care providers. Mm-hmm. We know that there's been an incredible amount of, it, particularly during the pandemic and, and following, um, there's been a lot of literature around care burden um, and just inequity. Um, that we deal with as female care providers versus male care providers. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And the way that impacts us financially, the way that impacts us emotionally, psychologically, mm-hmm. um, and even in sort of the longer term of, uh, of a professional life, mm-hmm. what that impact is like. So I think that area in particular, sort of the male versus male care provider, um, clinician, that role mm-hmm. that's been well I think yeah. well covered but we're having conversations about it yeah but we don't have solutions I agree and and it, it is a lot of deconstruction and um breaking down entrenched systems that have existed for a long time or those non-obvious implied biases and patterns of behavior breaking that down yeah it, it's so much more challenging than being like oh take this poster down or you know we don't say these words anymore it's just it's not the same no it's not the same yeah yeah exactly all right and with that i'm going to pause the recording
Um, where is it? Oh, good. I like changed the. Oh, here we are. 